This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Spectra 1964, Atom Audio, Isotope, Jay-Z Microphones, and Solid State Logic. You're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z V12 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100D Mic Pre and C610 complimenter with Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD and mixed on Atom Audio monitors. So please remember to check out our awesome sponsors using the link in the show notes below. It's a great way to help support this show. And now, get ready to rock. And then we wound up doing a Skype session, talking like you and I are talking. And then I said, hey man, I want to come over and visit. I've never been to that part of the world. And he said, let's do it. I'll find you a place to stay. And we set it up. He plays guitar with Smiley, still does. I go to Romania. And this is summer of 2017. Smiley's doing this big gig at this outdoor amphitheater, probably 4,000 people. It was awesome, man. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Atom Audio introduces the all-new A7V monitor with rotatable HPS waveguide for the accelerated ribbon tweeter and advanced onboard DSP-based room correction using the included A-Control software or optional Sonarworks software with a measurement mic, allowing you to tune your speakers for your room, your mix position, and your ears anytime you want. Get the extended five-year warranty for monitors that will improve as your studio improves at adamaudio.com. It's amazing that we can create professional mixes using a computer in our home studios, but trying to mix with a mouse, it's like trying to play the guitar with the tip of a pencil. It sucks. And why shouldn't you be able to mix as naturally as you play the guitar? That's why I upgraded my studio to include the SSL UF8 Fader Pack and UC1 Channel Strip controllers. They let me mix as fast as I can feel the music. Go put the fun back into your mixes at SolidStateLogic.com. Howdy, Rockstars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Josh Harris, an internationally known producer, composer, engineer, remixer, and music industry educator. His credits include top artists like Seal, Madonna, The Killers, and James Murphy of LCD Sound System. His corporate clients include NBC, ABC, MTV, VH1, and USA Network. Classically trained as a pianist and composer, he has always focused on fusing different musical genres, resulting in memorable songs and productions to stay with you long after you listen to them. No stranger to working with major label recording artists, in 2008, Josh toured with Grammy Award-winning artist Seal as his musical director and keyboardist. In both 2007 and 2008, Josh received nominations by the International Dance Music Association for Best Remixer. In 2011, he engineered a remix of Orpheus, for Quiet Carnival um, by Sergio Mendez that was nominated for a Grammy. Congrats on that, dude. In addition to being a contributing composer for California-based music library 21 South, Josh spends his time working on several original projects. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this artist's name. Two Soul? So it's Two Sail. Two Sail, okay. So it's spelled Two S-A-O-L. Cool. Two yeah. Sail, Room 111, and Casca. Um, thanks also to a shout out to our, our buddy, Roger Nichols, for originally making our introduction. I think you guys had done that SEAL tour together, in fact, right? Yeah, that, that's right. Because Roger played on the remix I did that that SEAL then called me after. It was like a weird, the remix led to the gigging opportunity. That's and Roger awesome. Roger played on the remix. Yeah, it was cool. That's awesome. So Josh has been a guest on the show before on episode 54, way back. So Rockstars, go check that out. And he talked about his musical background. Um, Josh has even joined me 
Lidge to teach mixing clinics both online and person. That was a lot of fun. That's something we need to repeat again. And Absolutely. today, you know, we'll talk about what's new in the studio and dive into some mixing and production advice for the home studio. So please welcome back Josh Harris to Recording Studio Rockstars. Josh, are you ready to rock, brother? Always, man. Always. So good to see you. Thank good you. Good to see you too, dude. Um, what was the last thing we did? I think it was, was it me coming to St. Louis when we did the mix clinic up there? Or was it you coming down here when we did a, a rock stars of mixing? Uh, I think it was when you came to Smith Lee, right? Yeah, that we, was we, a lot of we, fun. Did, we, and we had Smith Lee Studios is, is no longer? So are they, they still uh, there? The building is still there. It was sold. And now it's called Kalinga Productions, another, uh, a, a guy named Shri, uh, bought the building and he's kind of a, a guy that's spent a lot of time in tech from what I understand. And so the studio is intact and it's a st still a working studio. He just has his offices upstairs and, um, his other business, his main business. So it, it, it lives. You know, what's cool about Smith Lee is way back when I went to recording school down here at middle Tennessee state university, that was one of the places that was listed as an alumni of MTSU. If I remember correctly. Oh, I did not know that. I think so. I mean, I could be, I could be a little off on that, but that's what I remember. And I was like, oh, cool. There's, you know, there's this place right back here in St. Louis. Cause for me, St. Louis was always like a second home. Yeah. Cause of your wash you roots. That's right. My wash you roots. <laughs> it just sounds funny to say wash you. It, does it? Yeah. For, yes. So rock stars as a reminder, I went to architecture school at Washington university before realizing that I really wanted to make um, liquid architecture <laughs> by doing music instead. But um, St. Louis has always been a really cool place. I've always really liked, uh, maybe I just have fond memories of college, but I always, have always felt like St. Louis has a really, um, uh, I feel like a thriving creative scene. I know maybe you, you, may, you might have more insight into what the professional music environment is there, but but on a creative level, I feel like there's a real variety of, of creations in, in music and art and everything else. Oh, there, de there definitely is. Yeah. I mean, I think that St. Louis, you know, having grown up here, left for many years and now I'm back and have been back for uh, nine years. I think that there's a lot of cool stuff happening here, but you do need to look for it a little bit. It's not, you know, because it's not an industry town, it's not two inches in front of your face. Sometimes you have to do a little digging, but there's, there's some good talent here. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I sort of was a big fan of the indie rock scene that was there and the, um, you know, alt country and things like that. So, so I always kind of liked the fact that there was weird stuff being done, you know, there is some weird stuff. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so tell us a little bit about what's going on with you, man. You are, um, are you in this, you're not in the same space I saw last time. Cause that was at Smith Lee. Right. So I, now I rent a room, um, from Carl Napa, who was a guest. Uh, I don't remember what his podcast episode. He was way was. back there. He was way back. Um, so Carl, he's OG. Rents, OG. He's OG. Yeah. So Carl rents uh, a building in, in an area called the Hill and he has the main, uh, live room, tracking room and control room. And then I rent a room, a small room, and then another guy named Lamar Harris rents another room. So there's three of us here and we just operate independently and it's been great. I mean, Carl's a good friend and, um, it's just cool to be, uh, in a space with all music guys. I should probably say OP for original podcaster. Instead. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's pretty hip, dude. So I think you you just listed four pe four different people working out of the building. Is that right? So is no, that just, um... just just myself, uh, a guy named Lamar Harris, who's a who's a really talented. I mean, he plays a lot of different instruments, but horns, trombone, um, DJs. He's he's from here, so he's been a long time um, participant of the scene here in many facets as a jazz guy, as a soul guy. He has a big band. Um, and then Carl, uh, so it's just the three of us, but Carl, okay. by yeah, four, Carl, I met three, of course. Right. Of course. <laughs> now for those, any St. Louis people listening, uh, this building used to be music masters back in the day, a guy named Greg Trampy owned this building. So I think a lot of work was done out of here. Uh, I don't know what kind of work. I just know that, uh, this was Greg's place years ago. I wonder if that's where we recorded. Cause we did a songwriting 
competition um, for Blueberry Hill when they would they would, every year they would host a, a songwriting competition and Blueberry Hill rock stars is um, it's it's a, a bar restaurant but it's also kind of this this keeper of the history of St. Louis and the Loop area and everything and um, I fr- I'm not remembering the name of the guy off, off the top of my head I'm sure Joe Edward know. yeah Joe, Joe Edwards. Edwards right yeah. And um and so they would do a songwriting competition and then they'd press final a final record of all the winners. And so we got a chance. We won this the country category with oh, a song nice. called Dogs with Their Heads Out the Window. I that like opens it. with my banjo riff. I like it. I didn't know you played banjo. Yeah, yeah. A little banjo, a little fiddle on the side. Fantastic. <laughs> um and then we got to go into a studio, and that was one of the first times I saw a real studio too. And it was it might have been Music Masters over there. Yeah, well, was, when you yeah. when you're in town and uh, you come over here, you'll you'll know because most people who've been here before come in and go, it looks the same. Uh, that's great, man. <laughs> so, well, so what's it like uh, being in a space, a shared space, where you actually see other people coming and going, and multiple people are making music? Yeah, it's cool. I mean, I'm used to hearing other people work from my time in New York uh, when I was doing a lot of that remixing. In the early 2000s, we were we were sort of sandwiched in these these uh, these office spaces that were converted to studio spaces. So you know you would hear someone else's kick drum through the wall, and then someone else's kick drum through the other wall. Um, so you'd have to go into the headphones sometimes, but it's it's fine. You know we're 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 all here at different times. Um, you know Carl is here mostly in the evenings, and then on the weekends, uh, he does tend to track bands. So there are some days where I just hear drums all day and I just work with it, but I like it. I, I prefer to be around other creative people who are doing their thing. I find that really inspiring. It's just, it's just cool to hear other music being made besides what I'm doing. Yeah. So it, it's, um, you know, I've always, I've always enjoyed hearing what other people are doing and also it gives you a chance to meet other artists and other people, uh, who are out there doing stuff. I mean, not just musicians, but sometimes there might be other engineers. I mean, Carl has a lot of people drop by when he's working on projects. So uh, it's a very social type of a hang. Yeah. And the Hill is known as the sort of like a Italian center of St. Louis. Is that right? It is. Yeah. For many, so you guys many probably decades. Got some good food right around the corner. Very good food, some good <laughs> bakeries, a lot of places to walk. So it's cool. And uh, you know, at Smith Lee, there were certainly other people there, but we were, I was upstairs in a room and the studio was downstairs. So I was sort of isolated in a different way than I am now. Yeah. And then, um, my band, Enormous Richard, which, which was, um, with Chris King, who's been a guest on the podcast as well. Um, Chris lived, the band house was right there near you on Marconi street. Yeah, that's and that's where we are on Marconi. You're on Marconi. Okay, great. Yeah. And the band house was across the street from a Catholic church, I believe, um, and it used to be a funeral home. So there, yeah. there's a few things mixed in. To that you, story, yeah, you're you, know? you were right down the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, very cool. And then of course, rock stars. If you're not familiar with who Marconi was, this is relevant too because he invented radio. That's right. That's so right. it all comes full circle there. A little bit of trivia. Um, what's some stuff that you're really excited about in St. Louis and the music scene? I know Carl's also got a lot of great things going on with education, as do you. Um, what, what are you excited about in that part of the country there? Well, you know, um, one of the things that I like about being in, and I, let's just call it a, a non-music town. Uh, and what, what, by that, I mean, it's not LA, it's not Nashville, it's not New York, is that I, I think that people are, uh, they're more up for doing, let's just call it riskier art, different types of art. Um, there isn't the pressure of trying to be part of a scene per se. So I, I think people are a bit freer and looser with their approaches. Um, I have some friends who are really good jazz players who gravitate towards doing interesting projects. Uh, some of them solo work, some of them trio and ensemble work. Um, so I, I I like to go out and and just listen to what other guys are doing just to hear where their ears are. I find that an interesting exercise to hear how other people are hearing music. Yeah, uh, there's definitely a lot of cool stuff going on up there. Um, I remember there always been a great jazz scene. There's a great old school blues scene as well. 
um, that's probably pretty tied into the tourism world. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a different, you know, it's a different headspace when you're not making music to pitch to a publisher or you're not part of that sort of industry grind. Um, there's something liberating about not being part of that, creatively speaking. Yeah. Now, do you find yourself, you got like one foot in both worlds, like one foot is kind of working with indie artists that are, you know, the goal is what they need their personal, you know, artistic goal to be. And the other foot is um, in a world where you might be creating something that needs to survive in a world of labels and publishing companies and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. It It, it is a different, you have to flip the switch. Um, when I do the the label publishing stuff or even, um, you know, some of the composing I do for television, it's, it needs to be a specific thing. Uh, it's not the time to get, to sort of go out on a whim and, and, uh, you're, you're not, you're not doing it for yourself, uh, the same way that you, you can get away with that. If you're working with an artist one-on-one or somebody who doesn't have aspirations of being famous. They just want to put out really good product that's true to their artistic vision and you're there to help them and guide them through that process. Yeah. I feel like sometimes, I mean, I don't want to be unfair to, you know, the, the, the art form of things, but I feel like sometimes we make decisions about what should happen in a production or in a recording based on it's whether the door will be open or closed to that particular song. So for example, we might, we might make a decision about vocal tuning that may guide us in a direction because we feel like, you know, if we don't, the door won't even be open to this project. Whereas an independent artist, it might be more uh, a question of if, if we tune the vocal, will it now sound unfamiliar to the people that love this artist and what they're doing? Cause they see them play all the time. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And actually, with vocal tuning uh, specifically, in the last couple of years, I think I've done the least amount of tuning that I've ever done since I started, since tuning vocals became a thing. Because um, you're now working with great singers? Well, I feel like I've always worked with really good singers. But to your point about the pressures of, you know, like it's it's a different headspace when you're putting a production together and you're thinking about what the A&R guy is going to say when they hear it, uh, there can be a little bit of PTSD involved with that, where you you don't want a rough mix to sound rough. You don't want anything to sound rough because you don't know what people can hear or not hear, or if they have an imagination and, and can say, yeah, I, I get what you're doing. You're at 70% completion, like finish it. It's great. I, I, I don't do that. I, you know, when I turn something in to somebody on, in that world, it's 99.5% done. Yeah. PTSD, uh, of course, standing for production, turning in shitty decisions. Is that what yes, you mean? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but with these, with these recent projects I've done, you know, I, I'm working with some of the same singers that I've worked with in the past, but they're, they're not doing label stuff. And it's just, I don't know, like we're, I'm just not buried in, in Melodyne and auto-tune. I mean, I'll tune a word here or there if it needs it, but generally speaking, I'm leaving it alone or comping and, and just doing it old school where, you know, when the vocals get in the cracks, that's some of the beautiful stuff, even in pop music, you know? Yeah. I think that's uh, a cool topic thinking about like to tune or not to tune and, and the why of it. So for example, one of the things that occurs to me is that, um, well, the, the music is trying to express something, right? The vocalist is trying to express a message to us, is trying to emote an emotion, um, not to be redundant, <laughs> but you know, so if, if a singer is too much out of tune, that can distract us from, feeling that emotion. So it can become the thing we focus on. But also if it's too in tune, it can remove the emotion because it almost sounds like it was effortless now. And and so there's not a human reaching for something element that that happens when a singer is reaching for a note, right? That's kind of what you're getting at when you talk about in between the cracks. Yeah. And, you know, I I think that it's, it's interesting where we are in the evolution of music because I keep reading articles how back catalog is the most consumed music, the most streamed, older music, 
pre-auto-tune, pre-Pro Tools, a lot of it at least. And there's something to be said for that, going back to whether it's 70s, 80s stuff where you had to get it done. Uh, the, you really, I mean, the, the bar was higher from the recording standpoint, which I think then yields a, a different outcome. And I, I just find myself drifting back to that more. I mean, I can't, you know, I've got hardware, I'm back on hardware keyboards for a lot of the work I do now. Um, obviously, I still do my mixing in the box, but there's just something about those decades. Uh, for me, 60s, 70s, 80s, and a lot of the 90s, the, I thought there were some really special, special, uh, there was a lot of special music made. And yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's funny because you hear the talk uh, these days about old catalogs are the ones that get all the, you know, the player time on Spotify and streaming and things. And I think that the discussion often goes towards questions of, well, is that, you know, is there, is there, is it Im imbalanced? Is it weighted towards those artists because they're on big catalogs or because there's, you know, financial interests, but it's really fascinating to think that, you know, a, a question could also be asked, have we actually dug ourselves into a hole with modern production and vocal I, tuning such that people now just want to go back and hear performances? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's a fair question. And also, uh, I think that a lot of the young singers that I have worked with and, and, and hear through projects that friends of mine are doing, a lot of people sound like each other. Uh, right. And with Splice and just the way that things are put together now, we all have access to the same stuff. So you have 25, 30, let's just say 17 to 21 year old singers who have all sort of come from the same school. They listen to the same artists. They do the same riffs. I just, what I struggle with with a lot of younger artists is that I don't think that they have developed a sense of their own artistry yet. And a lot of, there's a lot of imitating and you could so almost swap out their vocals with someone else's vocals, with someone else's vocals, and it would be fine. Whereas the music, the eras we're talking about, if you were to listen, I'm just going to throw this out there. Like if you were to listen to, imagine listening to Simon and Garfunkel without their voices. Right. With It'd be Bob weird. Dylan. And, It'd be weird. And yeah. Cat Stevens. Right. I mean, <laughs> none of those people sound, sound like each other, but you can tell the eras that they came from, from the production and just the sonics of the recordings. So I, I think to your point, we may have dug ourselves a little bit of a hole with these, uh, these sort of playbooks and rule books of like how to craft the perfect pop vocal. I mean, everything sounds the same with new music. Yeah. Uh, I find, yeah. uh, except, except for if you're listening to something, you know, like something really indie or something off to the, you know, off the cuff. Yeah. Especially with, like you said, when you get into making music on with independent artists where there's that more artistic freedom, um, I find that there are a lot of really interesting things happening and you get, you get new ideas and you get stuff that, that breaks the boundaries and breaks the rules, which makes it a lot of fun to do. Yeah. The other thing I notice with a lot of, cause I mean, the way I work, I'm a track guy. So it's usually me and a singer or, or I'm either co-writing or somebody's written their songs and they give me demos. And then I, I produce the demo to, to a full, you know, developed song, uh, production. But what I have run into a lot in the last, I'm just going to say 15 years, is that somebody, let's just say again, in that 17 to 25 age group would come in and they'd have a song and they would say, I really want my production to sound like a combination of like Rihanna meets Maroon 5. And it sort of just becomes this amalgamation of the five things that they're the most excited about at that moment. And that's where... I've, I've struggled because I don't, I don't really, I mean, if that's what you want to do, we can do that, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right direction for your voice or your writing or your artistry. And that's where the rub is. Yeah. Yeah. 
If you've ever wondered how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of Recording Studio Rockstars, it's because I've been cheating by using Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron on every single episode. Right now, you're hearing on my voice, RX Breath Control, D-Click, D-Clip, DS, Deplosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone Multiband Compression, Neutron EQ, and Limiting, all from Isotope. Check out the subscription option with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plug-in purchase. No matter where you like to rock in the galaxy, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron lets you record up to two terabytes over USB-C with speeds of up to more than a gigabyte per second, transfer your tracks in a flash, and take your samples and sessions with you to the studio or stage. The OWC Envoy Pro Electron is your waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof SSD that you can rely on. Use our custom link in the show notes to help support this podcast at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Um, well, let's let's continue talking for a moment about uh, working with local artists and stuff like that. What are some things that you've learned about um, best practices with local artists? What about just finding, you know, for somebody out there is listening and, and they're thinking, yeah, I'd love to do my home studio um, and I'd love to work with local artists and find cool people, but how do I find them? What are some ways that you've found work well for just sort of connecting on the local scene so you can begin to work with uh, local artists? Well, one good way is to, you know, if you happen to go catch national touring acts, there's almost always, well, I shouldn't say almost always, but at, at national touring acts that let's say would play at a place like Blueberry Hill, there most likely is a local opener. So I've seen some cool local bands opening for national acts. We also have Off-Broadway here, uh, which is a cool sp space. And there's there's a, some cool music. There's a cool music scene down on Cherokee Street. So there's pockets. Um, and there's, there's um, I mean, every, you know, one of the challenges with a, a town like St. Louis is that I do feel like everyone's kind of on their own island. Although a lot of us know each other, we're not necessarily working together the way you would think of it in Nashville or or you know, an industry town, so to speak. So, uh, I like checking out open mics. Um, I like just actually just checking out what's going on in the riverfront times and just using, which is like the Nashville scene for St. Louis. Um, I like checking those sources for, uh, what's going on. And, and we also have a lot of new venues being built. Um, there's a really cool place out in, in out in West County in Chesterfield, the factory. Again, that's mostly national touring, but they're building a big rehearsal space for national touring acts to come through. So nice. on the local level, I, I still believe in going out and doing face-to-face, -face, hanging. If you see a band you like, like maybe grab lunch with one of the guys. I mean, I've met with a couple of local bands and and mentored some some local bands. And and really we've done more hanging out outside of the studio and talking than we have in the studio or even seeing them live um, yeah. because, you know, that's a whole nother side that gets ignored. What are some uh, things that come to mind when you think about going out and seeing a show um, examples from your own memory of how you were able to connect with new people and new artists? I mean, maybe this is sort of a dumb basic question, but I'm just curious if anything, if you remember any times where you're like, you know, I went and saw the show and you know, I just went up and said, Hi to so and so, or I just I'll, said, I'll give great you, I'll music give you, or whatever. Yeah, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, so several years ago, um, a friend of mine named Michael Tomko, good friend of mine here, was doing used to do this event where it was called Undercover Weekend, and he would he would he would assign specific songs, cover songs to local bands, and these cover songs would be in genres that were very different from what the bands did with their own music. So, so uh, he's, put, he's putting together a show with these bands playing the cover. So that's brilliant. Yeah. So you might have a bluegrass band and this, this is actually what happened. So uh, I went, this was a few years back and uh, you know, it was something like, I think these guys did uh, third eye blind, semi-charmed, uh, semi-charmed kind of life. 
And this was Les Gruff and Billy Goat. And these guys are more like kind of Austin, you know, kind of bluegrass alt country. And they did a really good job. And I met them and then, you know, fast forward a couple of years and then I did some mixing for them on a project. So I went up and I, I just talked to them. I was hanging out. Uh, I thought they did a great job. Everyone did a great job. And that's the kind of event where, you know, when you've got good talent on stage and they're doing good work, you hang out afterwards. Eventually everyone spills out onto the floor. You say hi, maybe exchange numbers, or you go to their next gig and just, you know, you, you got to show up. You yeah, physically these days have to... you, you message each other on Instagram too, that kind right, of stuff. Right, right. Yeah. But I still, I still, man, I still believe in the face-to-face. I, yeah. I just, I, I will, I always will. No, I just meant as opposed to exchanging numbers. Sometimes oh, people yeah. are just like, oh, here's my IG. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, um, th- well, and yeah. it just, it's a good reminder too, when you say a couple of years later, you're mixing. That's something that took me maybe a minute to learn. And then sometimes you take, you know, you need to work for a few years and then you look back and you're like, oh, I see. Sometimes you plant the seed and like two years later, you're making a record together. And that is the length of time that things happen. There's always that question too of uh, record cycles for artists. That may that may have changed with singles, but there was, you know, a period where it was sort of like you do a record with an artist and you're really not going to see them again for another year at least maybe two years, because that that was actually the cycle of making a record and going out and touring it and promoting it for them before they're ready to make the next one. Yeah, I, you know, absolutely. And I think sometimes uh, what goes on now is people stockpile assets where you might go in and do an EP's worth of music in one shot, but then you'll trickle out a, a, a release every six to eight weeks and then culminate it with you know, let's just say the fourth and fifth song as a, as a, an EP release, but you've released three singles from that EP prior. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of asset building. Yeah. What are some ways that you've seen artists successfully trickle out the, the, um, singles and make that kind of really make sense when you look back on it in hindsight? Well, you know, it's a good question because I do think that we're, way past the point of being able to just release something on a streaming platform, cross your fingers and hope that it just organically blows up. Um, We're way past that. So you've got to synchronize the release with, let's just say, strategic performances, social media blasts. I mean, it's, it's, it's got to work like a label would, would do it where there has to be some sort of promotion and you've got to figure out a way to get above the noise floor. So it, what, what I have seen and where, again, I would call it a rub is that most of the young, and this is not a St. Louis thing. I see this all over the place. Most of the younger artists that I work with spend 90% of their time in the studio on the recording and about 10% of their time on all the other stuff. And I don't want to say it has to be flipped, but it can't be that. It, it probably should be 50-50 recording to the other stuff or maybe 30 to 40% recording and, you know, 55, 60, 65% the other. But they're, they're clearly, and it's, it's not easy because you've got to do TikTok. I mean, you, there's so much other stuff. If you think back to when your band put its first release out, you We just, were doing uh, hand-published zines and sending them out to a mailing list, you know? Right. Yeah. Xerox hitting the Xerox machine. Yeah. I mean, now, you know, you've, you've got to do the, you've got to release the single. You need to be on one of the platforms. You need to stoke those fires daily build, you know, and not only just put your own stuff out, then you've got to go engage with other people. And I, I think it's almost impossible for one person to do it all by themselves. Uh, you're talking about multiple jobs. So uh, to your to your question about what have I seen? I, I mean, I, I see a breakdown happening where there's a focus on the release, and there's just not a lot of effort being made to do the other stuff the outside of maybe a sh- like yeah, that. maybe maybe a show, maybe some sort of a show, right? Uh, but it it is it is challenging, man. It, it's it's you know it, it's the sixty four thousand dollar question. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, I'm, I'm more curious about it these days because I've started putting out my music too. And, um, you know, on, I've, I have a couple of different examples. So on the one hand, 
I put out a song that is all about a day in, in the spring, you know, called Spring. Spring is an amazing thing. And that one, I released it um, where we did a live stream with Ian Shepard, who mastered it. And so there was a process of, you know, sharing it with the rock star audience and, and just being able to present it that way. Um, and it seemed to really launch pretty well. And then on the other hand, more recently, I'm putting out, um, now this will be, in hindsight, it'll be out now, but putting out my record, Skadoosh, and releasing singles. And of course, these are songs that we're familiar with from listening to the podcast. Absolutely. In fact, the big joke for me is, um, is uh, the podcast is now well over 2 million downloads since we started. So thank you to you for being an early guest on oh, the show, Josh. Thank you. And so uh, <laughs> that music has been in all these episodes. So I figured like, well, now that we're double platinum, why don't I put the record out? You know, Absolutely. So, right. It's so, enough of a tease. Yeah. So I'm going through that and, and I, you know, we're doing, following the model of put out a single, put out a single, put out a single. Yeah. And it's having a different kind of traction. You know, it doesn't, it didn't get as many plays as the other one where I put it out in conjunction with email list and, and uh, yeah, YouTube I, video and stuff. So just to your point, when you mix and match like that, I find that the, that is a smart way to think about releasing our own music. And it's going to be different for everybody. For me, I happen to have a podcast, so I tie right, it Right, right. I mean, you know, an audience is an audience is an audience. So you see actors migrate over to singing and they've got a following from their acting and then the music just organically takes off. So the noise floor is really, really difficult to, to rise above now. Uh, I mean, if you think about, I think it's something like 60,000 titles are uploaded per day on Spotify. Um, and this is why, you know, I say like, just, I'm saying to just sort of trickle it out, send some emails out that, Hey man, uh, pre-save or, you know, pre-save my release. It's coming up in a few weeks. I think you got to do more than that. And what you were doing about having a mastering session in conjunction with a release. I mean, you've got to figure out events that make sense for your project and the, and the style of music you're doing. That's a really cool idea. What you do with with Ian? Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm you you know the expression the E got right where if you're where what is it your Emmy your Grammy your Oscar and your Tony Award if you get all of them. Um, so I guess mine would be um, you know put it out on Spotify. Make sure it's on the podcast. Get it on Apple Music. And then, you know, partner up with your mastering guy to release it. So so mine would be the spam version. There you go. There you go. I like that. <laughs> the spam version. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, um, let's see. We're, we're going in all kinds of directions, which is great. One of the things you said was you talked about going out to a show. Now, um, I know that in my experience, that was something I enjoyed doing at a younger age. And as I got older, I found that I didn't do it in the same kind of way. And a, a fair question um, that ties us into another topic that I know you're you're uh, very serious about is, you know, lifestyle and routine and staying healthy. You know, like maybe you're not out partying all night and drinking beer and smoking cigarettes and and doing that kind of hang. Um, what what does that mean for you? How do you find a balance for studio life where you're able to interact the way you want with the artists? but also like keeping your health routine because you're, you're a healthy dude. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's a good question. And, I, and I, as I get older, I, I clamp down on the healthy stuff more. Uh, as far as the studio work goes, I work during the day. I'm up early. Um, when you know family responsibilities aren't causing me to start the day late, I try to get in the room by 9.30 and I work till 4.30 or 5. I, I still believe that proper business gets done during the daytime. I, I understand that creative people like to stay up late and do all this stuff, but I've never, I've never uh, had a business discussion at one in the morning that yeah. wasn't maybe something, you know, off of a few rounds of drinking. Right. Fueled um, by the wrong kind of uh, Yeah. Energy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the recording stuff happens during the day. As far as going out to see live music, which I, which I don't do as much of, obviously, as I used to, when I go out, it's very purposeful and I know what I'm going to see because I've done some digging around on YouTube or I've got uh, on good authority from friends like, you know, go check this out. These guys are good or this guy is good. So it's not just I'm bored. It's a Wednesday night. Let me just hit a, a bar to hit a bar. 
Uh, generally, I like to stay for maybe part of a set. Uh, I try to be home. If I'm out, maybe no later than 10, 30 or 11. And uh, if, I'm, if I do decide to drink, which I don't drink that often, it's really almost never more than two, two beers over the course of being out. Because I can still get up and function. Let's just call it 90% of normal. Right off that. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about your functioning for you. So, you, um, if I, as I recall, you're pretty serious about martial arts and that's that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I got into, um, you know, I've certainly had a streak where I was not living healthy. It was in my, uh, yeah, it was in my mid 30s when I was really deep into the remix stuff and still kind of floating between. It's my early days of New England and New York and floating back and forth. And it just got to a point where, you know, I'd gained weight and, you know, the doctor said to me, and I don't mean like it was out of control, but it was like maybe 20 pounds up from where I, sh- I would want to be for my, my size there, you know, and I think the, uh, the sugar levels were high and they were like, look, man, you're heading in the wrong direction. You're 35, 36. Uh, you need to, this, this was in, um, the mid two thousands. And, and so I just, I can't even this. picture that for you, dude. You just, I know it's weird. It's weird. Super There's, fit. Thanks. There's a couple pictures still lingering around in my mom's house from when I was, you know, it was the fall of 2006. That was sort of when it, it was, uh, it, you know, it was the tipping point. And then I just, I dropped the weight, um, stopped eating sugar. Sugar is, and I don't want to make it sound like I don't eat ice cream or pizza or go off the rails. I do, but it's controlled and it's calculated and it's offset by the next day or part of the next week or whatever, you know, evening out whatever I, whatever damage I did. Um, and the, and the cleaner your eating is the less you desire to eat that stuff. Your body just doesn't start jonesing for, for candy when you don't eat that much candy to begin with. So I lost the weight and then shortly after that, you know, I, I, and I've always done a little bit of weightlifting, but it was sort of that, that ignorant weightlifting where I didn't really know what I was doing. And I'd go to the gym and you sort of like, you know, screw around and do some things. And there was no programs. There were no programs. And then I met a martial arts instructor up in New Hampshire where I was living. And this was in 2009. He belonged to the gym I went to and he offered me, uh, this is, he's a karate instructor and he offered me a private lesson and it kind of went from there. So I got into Kempo, which is a, a karate. And then from there I got into Sistema, which is a Russian martial art. And then I got into kettlebells and I've stuck with all of it. Uh, and then, and then just gone deeper and deeper into the fitness world and found some online guys who were sort of nerded out on kettlebell strength and conditioning. And, and mm. so it's, it's like my workouts are kind of a part-time job, but it's all very calculated. And, and I journal, um, you know, I take it as seriously as I take the, the, the producer job. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I really, there's a lot of parallels. I, I think that if you ask your body to perform, uh, certain things that are challenging, generally speaking, the day unfolds a lot smoother. I work out in the morning. I get up really early. A lot of times I'm working out. It's dark. I do my best to work out outside as often as possible, even in the cold. And there's just something about pushing through those morning workouts where when you're done, that's typically the hardest part of the day. And then the rest of the day is pretty smooth. So this is all before you're hitting the studio at 930 in the morning. Oh yeah. And I don't, look at my, I don't sit around and look at my phone in the bedroom. I'm not reading my phone. I don't look at it until after I'm done with my workout. Mm -hmm. It's all very, it's all very structured and disciplined, but what I found, and, and this is why I think it's important that we talk about this is the mental clarity that you get from doing the training in the morning. My work kicked up a level. All of a sudden I became you know, I was hearing better and the mixes got tighter and I could hear EQ better. And just my physical state was improved. And then the other senses, you know, your eyes, your ears, your just your mind just got sharper. 
Are you recording your own music or other people's music in your studio, but you're having trouble figuring out how to get your mixes to sound great? Do they sound weak and distant or lack punch and clarity? Well, I've got a gift to help you take your mixes from sounding like basement demos to sounding like professional mixes. And it's my free course called Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you're in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus, Studio One, Reaper, or whatever you're using. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now, and you can find the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. The Jay-Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia featuring the patented golden drop capsule design for enhanced clarity that will give your recordings that classic vintage tone. You're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z V12 mic. Our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have come up with a special offer only available to Recording Studio Rockstar's listeners, so use the limited time coupon ROCKSTAR to get 40% off the V67, V47, and V12 microphones. Go to jayzmic.com and get your vintage mic now. Yeah, I've done some morning routines in the past. I, I, I haven't been recently. I've been switching to an end-of-day routine. Two thoughts about that. One is, is I find that routine is very helpful. So knowing when and how I'm going to do something helps me a lot. You know, winging Same. it is hard to do. Um, but two is the morning thing when I did it. So at one point I was going to the gym in the mornings. At another point I was doing all my running training in the mornings. I used to Probably right about when when we met, I was still doing marathon, barefoot oh, marathons yeah. Yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. And I would always run in the morning before the sessions. And morning routines take a little bit of teaching myself to get used to, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, then, for me. But once I was used to it, it wasn't such a big deal, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it took me months to to switch over uh, to, to really early morning. And don't get me wrong, like, I'm very rarely in the mood to train and do all of it when right. I get up. I don't get what up. What time and, do you get up? Uh, most days it's 4.30. Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. When I first got into weightlifting, I got a book that was all about weightlifting. And the guy was like, you know, he was talking about how he did his weights at 4, 4 4.30 in the morning. And he just trained himself to get up and do this whole workout routine because it was the only way it could get done. And it feels that way in the studio sometimes, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, I consider our jobs performance oriented, so I want to come in and because of the nature, uh, of my life and just family responsibilities with aging parents and that, that whole thing, I have limited time. So I have to come in and I got to nail it. If I have an afternoon and that afternoon is set aside to doing some composing for 21 South for one of our briefs, I need to get it done that day. It can't just be a thing where, oh, I'm going to just see how I feel, man, and, you know, feel it out. And if I don't get it done today, I can do it tomorrow. These are real deadlines. And there's, so you've, you've got to, it's like a gig. I mean, it's a gig. So if you think about when you, when you were doing gigs or playing with your band, you want to get on stage and feel switched on and you're dialed in and sharp. And, um, that's, that's a lot of why I lean on the training or what I lean on the training for. Um, I just found that my overall quality of life improved tremendously. Plus we're also at an age where, you know, there are some people going the other direction and, uh, if you let it go too far, it's hard to, hard to get it back. Yeah. We're both in our fifties now and, um, and rock stars, you know, uh, just, just no, no judgment. I mean, there's, no, there's no many judgment. different ways to choose to, spend your day and everything. And I, and uh, no judgment if your choice is, I don't want to d focus on that. I just want to have the fun in the studio. But for me personally, I love, I love having fun. I love having a good beer. I love uh, other things that are probably not supposed to. No, I guess now that Biden uh, oh, yeah. pardoned you're all par of us, you're I can pardoned. talk about it. You're but, pardoned. <laughs> but um, you know, it's like, uh, and I love making music. It's just that I want to be able to do it for a long time. I'm, right. I'm, I'm like, I still feel like I'm, you know, close to getting it right, you know, which is probably yeah. a feeling that never goes away. Yeah. I, and I, th there's, there's just, there's a lot of parallels too. If you think about, 
long sessions and, and sometimes you have to grind through a long session or it's a difficult singer is off. It's just, it's not gelling. You have a workout like that. You know, you wake up and your body feels different every day. I mean, yeah. every, it's never the same body two days in a row. So some days you wake up, you crush a workout. It's awesome. Then the next day it can be really, really rough. And the studio can be the same way. I just have found you know, I switched the workouts to the morning just due to my schedule. It wasn't yeah. really anything other than that. And then I just found that, oh, hey, I feel I feel like I'm doing better work. Uh, I just feel sharper. And so then I just decided to stick with it. And, uh, you know, to me, I, I, and I know you're the same way, I want everything I do to be excellent. So if the lifestyle choices can make the music better, well, why wouldn't I just keep doing that? Yeah. So how long does that workout routine take in the morning? Um, but but you know, if hour. you're going in at 930, you're probably doing a few different things in the morning before you go into the studio, right? Yeah. It's, um, I mean, the workout stuff, you know, I don't want to bore people with a fitness podcast, but, uh, you know, it can be anything from kettlebell work to uh, just movement, mobility work. I, I do think as we get older and as I'm watching my parents get older, you really have to be aware of your movement. Uh, how your body moves. We're doing a lot of sitting, obviously, in the studio. Now I have a standing yeah. desk. Um, that's been a huge game changer. I've had it about a year. Yeah, tell and us about that too, because uh, I had a standing desk, and then when Carl redesigned my studio, he's he put me back in a chair. Oh, uh, and, yeah. And uh, it's a very nice chair, but I fucking hate it already because yeah, I'm wanting to stand up. I'm Her standing right now for this interview. Yeah, as am I. Herman Miller or not, it's still a chair. Um, so Tony Black, who was also a podcast alum. Yeah. Uh, when Tony left St. Louis and moved back to New York, he bought a standing desk for his apartment in Queens and he was telling me about it. And I trust him with these things because he does his, he does very thorough research. He loved it and just sent me the uh, link on Amazon and I bought it. And uh, my wife, Elena, helped me put it together. And man, also a game changer because one of the things that's really challenging about the studio is when you just feel that valley coming and you start to get a little tired and you just, you've been sitting and you're just, you're not quite there. But when you have a standing desk, you can sit down for 20 minutes, stand up for 20 minutes. You, you can move around and stay, you know, stay active. And I find that I don't have dips in the day at all. Is yours one of those ones that will go up or down? Yeah, it has memory. So you've got um, your speakers on the desk kind of thing, right? Yeah. So what I've done is, you know, I'm a small monitor guy. I've still got my Focal CMS40s and they're on these stands that are on the desk. I still have the attack wall. And luckily when the desk is raised and I'm standing, there's still enough room within the attack wall for everything to still be inside the horseshoe. Okay. And that was my big concern was just being able to get the the height right between, you know, where the tweeter woofers are hitting when I'm standing and am I still on the wall? Uh, and then obviously when I'm sitting, it's not a big deal, but uh, it's, and and I'll say this, man, I, I don't know if you've ever, well, if you had a standing desk, then you have, but I like mixing when I'm standing up. Oh, I loved, I loved standing up. And especially since a lot of making music and mixing is not making music and mixing, it's dealing with a Chrome browser and it's sending messages and emails and typing and things like that. And I was like, why do I, I just need to be comfortable. I just need to be moving right. about while I did all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I found that there was something about standing and mixing specifically for me, automating vocals. I felt even more connected to what I was doing than when I was sitting. I remember the first time I tried out a standing desk in my studio, I came back from a summer vacation where I had been out and about moving and I came back to my studio and there was the chair in front of the console. And I was just like, I don't want to get back in that thing, you know? And I, and so I brought in one of those Manhasset music stands and I just oh, yeah. set it up because it was all I had in right in front of the console. And I put my keyboard up on there and my mouse and I just stood and I, and I needed to comp a vocal and I found myself dancing as I comp the vocal and like turning it into this whole dance routine and I just was like, this is great. I love this. This is this feels like I'm making music. Yeah, it's it's cool. It took me a little while to get used to it. I wasn't sure how I would feel working a, a, a mixing while I was standing, but I love it, man. And so now uh whenever I'm specifically automating vocals, I'm I'm always standing. 
Yeah, so I next for me is to figure out how to make some sort of standing option so I can do some of what I do standing and then sit back down again when it's time for critical listening, I think. Yeah, I mean, if, if you have larger monitors, it's obviously a, a different situation than what I have. I mean, if I had some you know, 10 inch woofers or something like that. I mean, it would be a little, I would probably set the room up to where everything was positioned correctly when I'm standing. And then I would just let sitting be done for editing or stuff that maybe wouldn't be as, uh, you know, critical listening, those types of things, or even just go into the headphones if you're just editing. But yeah, I, uh, I don't know, man, it it was sort of a happy accident because I, I did the standing desk just to, to feel better and move more. I didn't know what it would do in terms of connecting me to the work itself. Yeah. And, and don't get me wrong, Rockstars, my studio is, uh, my control room is amazing and I love it. And Carl did an incredible job. The sound when I'm sitting and listening to the speakers is incredible. It's just that for me, for long hours, I like to not be sitting that long. That's basically what it is. So I got to, I got to figure out ways to get up and get it and move around. Right now I'm using a standing desk that was like, 80 bucks that I got on Amazon. It doesn't go up and down, but it works for standing. And one of the easy solutions for me is to just have something like that around. And I just scoot it up in front of the console, you know, put the keyboard up on top of it and just stand up for, for some of the work. Cause a lot of things I do, do don't require critical listening or they don't require perfect listening, you know? Right. Right. You know, the other thing uh, also we, we can touch upon this quickly is just when you're eating, especially if you have a band or artists in a lot of times taking a break to eat can kill a session. Um, right. I mean, I've, I've found that more often than not, if you, if you break in the middle of the day to go have an hour, hour and a half lunch, man, people are usually comatose afterwards. So yeah, we stopped going. I, I think in the beginning we used to try and go somewhere for lunch and I learned that lesson too. And I never, ever recommend that we go out to eat. Always pick, I definitely recommend we take a break and eat, sure. but, it, but it's always like as efficient as it can be. Just grab food, sit right down, yeah. eat, go right back to I work. I think as, was it was it Chris James when he was on was talking about when he, when he was working with Prince, like, man, I'd roll in, I'd have my snacks and my food and everything was packed and ready to go because I didn't know when we were going to start or when we were going to end. And I just, did, you know, you weren't going to take a food break. Right, right. Well, yeah. I've heard that Prince only lives on hard candies anyway, so, or did, you know. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Something like that. I don't know whether it's yeah. accurate. But I, I <laughs> you just probably hear I remember, a lot of rumors, you know. I remember him saying that. And I thought, yeah, you know, I, I kind of operate that way as well, where I, I I don't like to waste a lot of valuable time eating. And I don't like to eat a lot in one sitting because it just makes you tired and then you're you're fighting that the rest of the day. Yeah, I definitely don't like feeling the food comatose. Um I, I find that, you know, eating smaller meals helps. Um yeah, I don't know what else. I mean, probably the the least food comatose I ever felt was when I was eating raw vegan for a summer, and that was just a very extreme change for me. It was like, yeah, I probably had, wasn't eating lunch at all. In fact, I wasn't. I wasn't eating till two in the afternoon. <laughs> oh, but, so you were doing some scheduled fasting? Yeah, I did a whole intermittent fasting thing, and yeah. then but I lost more weight than I wanted to, so I, I went down sure. to like one fifty three or something, one fifty two. Wow, yeah, for, which pretty- for me just felt like. I was pretty pretty dang skinny for a minute there. People people said, "Hey man, have a have a slice of pizza." It's All right, okay. so we'll, we'll get off the workout topic. Yeah, but, sure, but sure. The last question here is: if you if somebody came into work with you and they were thinking, "I really would like to you know start exercising more, start getting in some shape, um, lose some weight," what what would be an instinctive first like workout routine that you might suggest they try out? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think that as far as bang for your buck workout tools th- that provide a lot of results w- in a short period of time, both in the workout and just a short period of time in terms of how quickly you'll see results are kettlebells. Um, I've been into them for about 12 years. And, uh, you know, again, you have to watch some tutorial videos online. I mean, the, one of the guys I follow is a guy named Pat Flynn. Um, right. If you, yeah. Pat Flynn kettlebells. If you were just YouTube him, there's a whole host of videos. Not um, Pat Flynn, the, uh, the, the online business guy. No, no, a different Pat Flynn. Oh, that's but so funny. This Pat Flynn jokes about that Pat Flynn. That's really um, funny. Anyway. Um, so 
kettlebells. And then, you know, the other thing I think that gets lost in the the workout conversation is the the diet actually is a bigger deal than the work than whatever fitness you're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, the the eating choices will affect your body in a much more radical way than whether you jump rope or run or swing a kettlebell or whatever it is you swim. Um, you've got you've got to have the workout and the the nutrition hand in hand uh, and sleep. Yeah, so that's a question for you. When you're trying to get up at four thirty in the morning, yeah, uh, are you getting eight hours of sleep in? No, it's usually seven. I usually go to bed around nine thirty, uh, which I know sounds so old man middle age, but really, well, if you're gonna get up uh, that early, you gotta. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you have to. But I'm telling you, man, like the the efficiency that that I've I, the the increase in efficiency that I saw, especially in the morning hours, once I switched to that schedule was it was just, it was too, it was too massive to deny it. Yeah. It'd be interesting if I was doing a podcast with interviews, Hey, wait, I am doing a podcast with interviews. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, if I was like, yeah, we can do an interview. I'll see you at 7.00 AM. I would yeah. be a little bit, yeah. might get a different. I, I, I also, you know, some of the, some of the successful people that I've, uh, you know, followed over the years, a lot of them are morning guys, you know, yeah. they get up and get yeah. it done. There, there, there's just something to it. I mean, I understand it's not for everybody and believe me, I used to have trouble getting up at nine in the morning. So well, there's a thing too with music and the creative side of things. There's there's no unquestionably a thing that happens late at night. So I absolutely a creative switch can flip for me where all of a sudden I'm doing stuff that I don't I wouldn't be able to do at nine in the morning or eight in the morning. Right. You know, I just don't think I'd be too awake for it. Sure. So so it's interesting how we do have to like sometimes we have to find the balance and live in both worlds. Like for a little while, we're, we're late night for another bit. We're early morning. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, I'm able to do this schedule because I'm mostly by myself. If right. I had, if I had sessions at night or I had bands coming in here, I would have to change my schedule. I'd still find time to do the workouts, but I wouldn't be getting up at four thirty. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I do to make sure that I still get my workout is is if it's going to get bumped by something else, I put it in my calendar. I block out two hours before that other thing happens, just so I don't schedule work then. Just so in my me- mentally, I'm thinking I'm going to go do my routine. And two hours, I don't work out for two hours, but two right. hours is my realistic window to stop one thing, you know, yeah, pause, do the workout. Same. Take a shower, get ready for right. the next thing. Same with me. Yeah, I block out a, a, the same amount. For 15 years, I recorded hundreds of bands like Jack White, Adele, and the Black Keys in my hay bale studio at the Bonnaroo Festival. I had to work fast and deliver finished mixes to the radio DJs within an hour, so I chose to use the Solid State Logic AWS 948 Plus for my mixing console. There's just no substitute for mixing on a real console. Until now, that is. SSL brings you the UF8 and UC1 controllers so that you can re- Recreate the feel and speed of mixing on a console with the flexibility of mixing on your computer in your home studio. Paired with the SSL Channel Strip 2 and 4000B plugins, you can now get a world-class sound using real faders and real knobs to mix as fast as your ears will guide you. Levels, panning, EQ, and compression, they're all built right into the controllers. So go put the feeling back into your mixes at SolidStateLogic.com. Adam Audio introduces the new A7V monitor for home and pro studios, the next generation of the incredibly popular A7X. The all new A series line of monitors delivers the same highly accurate transparent sound and unique accelerated ribbon tweeter design that has made Adam Audio famous for over a decade, but now introduces new innovations such as the rotatable high frequency propagation system waveguide, allowing the XART tweeter to disperse sound with controlled consistency and DSP-based room correction and speaker voicings. Using the A-Control software or SonarWorks in a measurement mic, you can now integrate advanced filters directly onto the DSP on board the speaker to help compensate for imperfect room acoustics without introducing annoying latency or requiring plugins. This allows you to tune your monitors for your room, your 
mix position and your ears anytime you want to meet your ever-evolving studio needs. Get the extended five-year warranty for monitors that will improve as your studio improves at adamaudio.com. Hey, rock stars! we're back now for the jam session, a.k.a. the second half of the show. My guest today is Josh Harris joining us from his studio in St. Louis. Josh, are you ready to jam, dude? Absolutely, man. Let's do it. All right, cool. Um, we don't need to continue on the, the health topic, but I will just close by saying uh, this interview is coming out in 2023. It's never too much to talk about it. We just went through 2020, 2021, and 2022. And if there's one thing I could contribute to um, the world of uh, home studio owners and studio owners and you know you rock stars who are listening to this is the importance of taking care of and taking responsibility for your own health. You know, be healthy, be in good shape, eat well. Those are the first and primary places to keep yourself in well and making records for a lifetime. That's right. It's the recipe. That's the recipe. All right. So tell us more about your studio. Right now you are joining us. I can see you on the video. I think you said you might be speaking to us in a nice C12 microphone. Yes. I, I only own one mic. Um, <laughs> nice. I bought it years ago. It's a C12 VR. I figured it would cover me for the majority of vocal recording situations. Oh, I'm sorry. I do have a beta 58, but I just felt like this would capture uh, capture my voice a little bit better. Yeah, that's great. Now, you're, you're a guy. Um, I know you work with a lot of women, a lot of female vocalists too. Yeah. When you got the C12, did you find that that is a great mic choice for female vocals? Do you find that's a great cho mic choice for uh, male and female vocals? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, uh, one of the one of the reasons I bought it was I used it uh, years ago. I think I've owned this thing for about almost fifteen years now, and I used one and I liked the low end. I know it can have a little bit of sparkle up top, but I really like the the depth of the low end. I've always worked with a lot of female singers, and something about uh, I just I like being able to capture the richness of the low end of a, of a voice. Uh, I think for me, as a, it's just it's just a taste thing. So I, when I first bought it, I was running it through an API 3124 into a tube tech seal one B and that was my vocal chain. And now I just do the universal audio version of that. Um, cause I sold some of that hardware a few years ago when I wasn't doing as many vocal sessions. So we're, we're, we're listening to the mic through uh, an Apollo, uh, with, you know, a, the pre and then, um, a, a tube tech compressor. Okay, cool. Uh, this, you're recording it on your end, which is probably what you're going to hear yes. Rockstar is while we're doing the interview, I'm probably hearing the Zoom version. Yeah. Um, but so when you're, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, because I actually was recently working with a, a female singer, um, very strong voice, you know, country genre. And so it goes from sort of quiet in the verses to really singing some powerful notes and, and syllables, really, I'd even describe it as like, like that in the chorus, where sometimes the power can be, it doesn't sound loud, but it's a lot louder than other stuff. And, um, and also you have issues like wanting to have a lot of presence in a voice. And I hear it in your discography where you've, you're doing um, dance mixes and things like that, where the voice needs to be really upfront and on top of all this um, rhythm section. But one of the challenges with with that is uh, is managing the S's in a voice where it's like you're trying to enhance it, but you don't want to make the S's like rip your head off. So two questions to you. One is how do you manage dynamics in a in a you know a strong singer? And then what are some ways that you get the S's to where you want, where you've got that balance of like um, enhancement of the sound, but the S's sound like they're in control. Uh, that's a good question. Um, one and and also just I'll add on to that. I'll add on before I answer it. Sometimes when you're working with younger singers, they don't have, um, let's just call it, the pop in their voice, the push. They're singing softer, and you've got to get them 
energetically to rise up to to match the level of the track. So uh, there's the, there's those challenges as well. But as far as the S's go, I think it's fair for me to say I've settled on multiband compression. For that, I use the uh, UA multiband, uh, the uh, what their multiband compressor. Um, I've just found that that works and better than just. Oh, and sometimes I use their deesser as well, the actual the deesser plugin. But I I found that with some of the singers, there is a lot of sibilance up top, and this mic does have a bit of sparkle, and so it does have to be tamed. I don't always find that I can do it just by EQing. I need to get in there and compress just those frequencies. I also do, I also use parallel compression almost all the time on lead vocals. Um, not so much on other parts of the track, especially if I'm programming the track, but almost always on leads and backgrounds, two separate parallel compression instances, one for the leads, one for the backgrounds. And I found that that, that helps as well. What would be something that you would put on that parallel compression for a lead vocal? Uh, just the Personas factory compressor. And I hit it at like 11 or 12, um, short attack, long release, squash it, and just push it up. It, it, do, it does add a little something. I mean, it's not a radical change, but, but it's, it's enough. I find that it's enough. Now, is this a reminder that you are working in Studio One for your production and mixing still? Yeah, I, I still am in Studio One. I just switched to version six, although by the time this comes out, six will have been out for a while. Uh, I love it so far. Uh, I think those guys continue to do such a great job at tweaking what's already a great program. Uh, they, they listen to their users. They listen to their users. So... Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the cool things about PreSonus and Studio One is that you have the ability to split a signal within the track itself and, and do yes. parallel compression without having to set up extra right. AUGS buses and stuff like that. And you know what's funny? I don't use that as much as I should. <laughs> well, once you get a, a way of going, a traditional it, way, once, it, once you sort of grasp it, you know, with any weird. of these systems, it's like once you got something that works, it doesn't really matter if there's a yeah. slightly better a more modern way to do it. It's like, if it works, it works. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I was thinking about that the other day, uh, that how some of us who've done this a long time, we probably could all be working a little bit more efficiently with the workflow enhancements that are within our respective DAWs. But once you sort of started doing it 10, 15 years ago, you kind of just, kind of just do it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, so. again... I remember when I first started out at, at Alex the Great, and I was working with Brad Jones, for example, um, and I was the young guy who thought, you know, there were these hot new ways to do things and, you know, thinking modern. And I'd see that he would stick to some of his tried and true ways. And it might get frustrating, for example, Brad, love you, you know, but I, as you would admit yourself, it took you uh, quite a while to finally get a cell phone. But the truth is, you know, he always did it in a way that worked. So it was like, you know, I might, I might have, you know, appreciate this modern tool and this modern method. But meanwhile, here was a mentor of mine who was producing a lot more cool music than I was and a lot more quickly, but he was just using old, you know, methods that were tried and true. So actually to that point, because yes, Roger did connect us, but you and I actually met. Do you remember me telling you the story? I think, yeah, I, yeah. You said we yes. met at Alex the Great. We right? met at Alex the Great because you were working on something with an indie artist. I don't remember her name. And I remember, but she was thinking about maybe doing some additional work with me. And then I went over and met you and you were the one who, this was like probably 1998 or 99. Wow. You were, you were, you were doing multiple stages of compression. And you were the first guy I saw to do that, where you would compress EQ and compress. And that is something I do. Once I saw, once I learned that from you, uh, you were on an O2R, if I remember correctly. Oh, yeah, that's right. We had that there for a while, where you yeah. had to like, speaking of, of dance moves, I remember every time you wanted to make an adjustment to a fader, you had to like go click, 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 and then make the move and then click, 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 yeah. click, 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 click. So, and they were like, did I get it? Okay, good. You know, it was like this whole but, five move scenario. But that, that concept of, of multiple stages of compression, 
uh, you know, I understand compression much more, much better now than I did obviously back then. So I know how to use it back then. I didn't really get it so much. Uh, but that's, that is another way to help the vocal rise above the density of a track. Yeah. It's just the right amount of compression. Yeah. I was working with the band of Trixo when I first learned about the idea of, you know, more than one compressor, you know, and yeah, and I think we ended up um, getting into triple compression. And the last time, to be honest, I did triple compression at the tracking, at the recording stage was on my own voice uh, for my EP that I'm still in the midst of. And it, it, you know, it takes, it takes a bit to get that set up. One thing about getting fancier with how you record stuff is you have to be more patient because you're going to, there's, there's, you know, an infinite number of more ways you could screw it up by not having yeah. things set properly. Yeah. But uh, I find, you know, as I've, you know, get older and, and just rack up more and more projects under my belt, EQ and compression for me are probably two of the most important concepts to learn. If you can get a really good handle on those two, it will take you so far in your mixing. What's one of the first things you learned about compression that you remember learning? Um, I actually, I would just use it to use it. So I didn't really understand what I was supposed to do with it, or I didn't really understand what the knobs did. I mean, I would just put it on and sort of hear it working. I sort of understood it in concept. And then I think I read an article uh, it might have been like Joe Ciccarelli or somebody years ago said, think of compression as a tonal shaping tool. And that changed everything for me. Then I started to go about it differently because I thought about how I wanted to shape the sound, not just reduce the dynamic range. Right. That was a big one. Yeah, I remember... Um being an intern at Woodland Studios and Bob Solomon, who was the owner, he brought me, he was mixing something on the Neve VR console. And he said, Hey, did you, you know, did you know about this? And he showed me taking the drums and feeding it to a parallel compressor and bringing it back in. And he turned it on and off so I could hear it. And I was like, Holy shit. <laughs> you yeah, know, the drums it's... sounded massive. I'd never heard that before. And then I remember uh, being over at Alex the Great and Brad would be you know pulling up drum sounds and then they took things like the room mic and compressed it and mixed that in and it was like whoa and that yeah. that was i don't think i i don't think i thought about it as a tonal thing i just realized that a compressor was like a new kind of paintbrush it, it would make a different sound a sound that didn't exist yet right right yeah it, it's for some reason that article and the way he explained it or the way he said to think about it, that just clicked with my brain. And then I felt like I could use it a bit more professionally than maybe I was. Yeah. And then the, the distressor thing, came out. Then the distressor came out. But the one thing about compression is that you can really trash something if you don't know what you're doing. Oh, absolutely. You can, really you can destroy over, the overwork sound. it. Yeah. You can overwork it and, it and you can't get it back. Yeah, so examples of that for me where I used to compress the snare to tape while we were recording or to tape to Pro Tools, whatever we were doing, um, because I knew that we wanted that snare to be exciting. And so we would, we'd would we compress it and we went in and had a, re uh, a song that we had completed and uh, Steve Albini, we were working with him at the point and he was going to mix it for us. And the very first thing he pointed out was that there was too much compression on the snare. And so he had to break out an expander. I think it was the mm -hmm. BBS or something like that in the rack. And he like re-expanded the snare to sort of like undo the compression we had did. And I was like, I was like, whoa, that's my mind. I don't even know. <laughs> I'm not even really sure what's going on here, but I'm sure I could screw it up 10 more ways by trying to even do re-expanding it. But, uh, but yeah. it was interesting. And that was the thing I learned. And then, you know, from Steve, I learned the idea of recording drums with no compression and just capturing the best drum sound you could um, and saving that compression for the mix itself, you know. But I think at this point, my next, uh, miss my next destination is to both record the drums with no compression, 
set up my mixer for parallel compression during the recording process, you know, run an 1176. Yeah. Um, or maybe get a DBX 160 or something like that and run that parallel and record that as well. I've done a tiny bit of that, but not very successfully yet. Oh, and print it? And print it. Yeah. Like, why yeah. not really yeah, try yeah. and go for that, you know, almost completed drum sound Well, you know, at the, the tracking stage? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of committing to, to sound and parts at the tracking phase. I mean, especially with guitar, if I'm working with guitarists, I mean, I'll take the dry direct signal, but I generally like to craft the sound then and there. We're good. Let's get it down. That's how they did it in the old days. There's plenty of amazing records with committed guitar sounds. It's okay. It's nothing to be scared of. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have, we've talked a lot on the podcast with, with various guests about the power of capturing a DI of the guitar while you're recording the guitar. I haven't done much of that because I guess I just haven't, you know, sometimes we, we have all these possible things we can do, but until you get to the point where you're like, okay, there's a really good reason for me to do it on this particular record. You know, you, you just sort of keep that in your little brain arsenal of tricks that you might try at some point. But I do have an artist that, that's going to be coming down um, that uh, shout out to you, Carl, if you're listening to this, uh, that, that we'll probably do that with. And um, two reasons to do that that were compelling to me. One is uh, if you're going to, like, let's say you take the guitar, run it into a DI, then go from the DI to the amp. So you're hopefully not loading the, down the guitar at all. Like you're getting the same sound of the guitar plugged straight into the amp. But then that DI being recorded into Pro Tools gives you two, two possibilities. One is that you can... Um, use that very clean DI track for as an editing reference, where sometimes you got distorted guitars and stuff like that, and you can't actually see the edit points if you wanted to retighten things up. But with a clean DI, you get a nice clean attack and you can see it. And then the other would be um, just the ability to reamp and add other, other amps later at the mix if you wanted to or something like that. Yeah. And one other, you know, to, to add on to that, I, I think it might've been a few years ago, I was doing some pop project and you know, where the, where the chords don't change a lot through the song. So to have the DI to maybe use something that was played on the chorus on the verse, uh, was because the chord structure was similar, having the ability to just reamp that direct signal into, let's just call it a smaller guitar sound for the verse part was cool just yeah. to have that. Yeah. Those options. Yeah. Yeah, and it, you know, if you don't have the DI and you're trying to reamp something that was already amped, that can it's just bad. sound goofy, you know. Yeah, it yeah, might work, so. and you could certainly take that and run it to an effect. I mean, that's basically just putting an, you know, that's what you do in a mix anyway. That's right. That's right. Um, all right. So let's see where where were we with this? Oh. So we got off on guitar DI DIs. Yeah. Um, I got all kinds of things to ask you about. Um, you still quite, we didn't get very far in describing your studio. Well, we did. You got the standing oh, yeah, yeah. desk, you got the focals, okay, yeah. you're in studio right, so, one. Anything else yeah. that's new that's, that's you're excited about in the studio? Yes. Um, so I just recently, within the last week, although it won't be within the last week when this airs, I bought um, the new Oberheim, the OBX8. Oh, cool. And, I just met Tom at NAM. Uh, well, again, a little while back. Yeah. Um, and then last year I bought a Profit 10. So I've migrated back to higher end uh, since because I'm finding that with some of my own personal projects, that's the sound that I want. And then I'm also finding the ability to use those synths in some of my composing work for 21 South, which is uh, a music library I do a lot of work with. And we provide music for a lot of different reality TV shows. So there's different, a lot of different genres and I'm, it's interesting that I'm able to use the analog keyboards in a lot of that music, even some of the stuff that's maybe just suspenseful or, or non pop or non-commercial. And then I have a, a Juno 106. And then also last year, I know this isn't new stuff, but I bought a, a Cobalt 8, which is a, a keyboard from a company called Modal Electronics. And it's pretty cool, man. Like it's it's a lower price synth relative to the cost of the Profit and the Oberheim, but it it's got a little bit of that sound designer type sound, you know. 
ethereal spatial stuff. So I'm using hardware synths so much now. Uh, I still have a lot of VSTs, but but it's pretty much hardware synths into my universal audio interfaces with all of them having 1073 mic pre's and tube tech compressors printed into Studio One. That's it. Nice. The OWC Envoy Pro Electron is your super fast and rugged pocket-sized portable USB-C SSD that keeps your music safe in the studio or on the stage. With storage of up to two terabytes and speeds of up to more than a gigabyte per second, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron gives you high-speed audio data for recording and playback. Take your sessions and sample libraries with you anywhere you go. Built for reliability, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof, so there's no need to worry about your music anymore. Find the new Envoy Pro Electron and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. And use the custom link below in our show notes because it's a great way for you to help support this podcast. So thanks, Rockstars. There's a lot of junk that needs to get cleaned up in a podcast or music mix. Boomy pops on the microphones, piercing sibilance, background noise, harshness, distortion, wild dynamics, and EQ correction. And all this editing and mixing cleanup would be impossibly time consuming were it not for the magic of Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron. Isotope gives you a collection of plugins for mixing in your DAW to manage plosives, clicks, S's, noise, buzz, reverb, breaths, and even guitar fret squeaks with set it and forget it simplicity. Check out the new Repair Assistant plugin to help you find the perfect mix prep settings for any instrument. And the standalone RX app includes new features like text transcription and multiple speaker recognition for easy editing and navigation. Try out the subscription app Option with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plug-in purchase. I've been getting into more analog synths too. I got into the Behringer stuff and have uh, finally now have a complete three-tiered rack, which is really fun oh, to cool. look at. I just cool. need to do more than look at it. <laughs> So tell us well, a little bit about your workflow. Now that you've got these cool synths, let's just, uh, I, you know, I'll just come right out and say it. I love synths. Synths get me excited. Um, I've, I will, I'll be entertained watching YouTube videos of people just making sounds with analog synths because I love the sound of that stuff. So, but, but a fair question. Um, and I guess yours aren't fully modular. So at least you have the advantage of, you could start with a preset, a, a working sound, but yeah. what's, What's the setup? For example, you've got analog going out to the computer. Maybe some of these synths actually have a um, an actual USB cable for a digital interface, and then oh yeah, what, and then the MIDI routing. Do you program on the keyboard or do you program in the DAW and it runs the keyboard, but then the analog comes back in? Yeah, good question. So um, they're all obviously the all the MIDI is USB. Um, all of the signal path is uh, non-USB. So each keyboard is, like I said, into a universal audio interface printed with the pre and the compressor settings into Studio One. Um, I generally, and I have all of them set up in Studio One as MIDI instruments, external instruments. And then I generally will play, you know, if I'm coming up with a part on the Oberheim, I'll play it on the Oberheim. Then I will track it in. Uh, I'll usually solo the MIDI and solo the audio track and listen as it's recording to make sure everything's cool. And then you do have to spend a second lining up the MIDI, sorry, lining up the audio, because there is a little bit of, you know, it is a little bit off. So I'll have to just shift it over. Uh, and then it's in and, but you're shifting over the whole track, not like yeah, you're yeah. not having to re chop it up and no, 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 no. You right. just, you just basically go find the start point and nudge it so right. that it lines up. Yeah. Um, and I don't remember what the millisecond is. I'm sure there, there's a pretty, I'm sure there's a number like maybe 50 or something like that. I, I can't remember. And there is a way there is a, con uh, there is a feature in studio one where I think you can do a tab to transient or something, or 
to move it so you can do a key command to do it. I just, I just haven't set it up to do that. But I love it. And one of the reasons that I love having hardware synths is that you just play them. You pull up a sound and you start playing and things come out, parts come out, ideas yeah. come out yeah. in a different way for me than if I was scrolling through patches on a VST. So now you've got the hardware synths, you're playing on it, and then the MIDI is going from the hardware synth to a MIDI track in S1. Yeah. And the audio is going to an audio track, so you're hearing the audio. And you might be in record right off the bat where you're capturing. So like if you're messing with the pitch knob and messing with the modulation and and or even turning a knob on the synth, is it possible that that stuff will get captured in as MIDI so it's recreated when you yeah. print it again a moment later or or not? Yes. So all of the all of my monitoring of the of the keyboards comes through Universal Audio Console software. Um, and then when I'm ready to record, I'll solo out the MIDI track in Studio One, create an audio track in Studio One, and just listen to the MIDI as it's being printed to audio. And then generally, if there is some filter info or mod wheel or something like that, I'll record that on a separate track before, because I've done that with my Juno, where I want to do a, a, a filter, opening the filter over 16 bars or something. Yeah, I'll just do that with the... Uh, you know, on a separate track, write it in or perform it in, edit it if I have to, and then just print the whole thing. I, I really like to capture things and then they're done. Yeah. I, you know, I just, I'm just back in that mindset where let's print it. Okay. That was good. The filter's doing what it needs to do. I'm not going to change my mind later. You know, I, I, I know some people like to leave everything in this state of, I can change it if I so please. It just but turns out you never so pleased as much as you think you were right, going to. Right, you know? exactly. But um, I like just committing to it then and there. And if something happens and I don't like the part, then I'll just replay the part. I always log my patch numbers. Uh, I always- How do you do that? You just put it in a comment on the track or something? Yeah, yeah. Or I'll name I'll name the track something like um, OB pad, or, uh, and then in parentheses, I'll put the patch number. Uh, because with some of the some of the Q work I'm doing, when I send it to the guys at 21 South, they may have a note or a comment. And if I've printed that audio and I need to go back and they might say, hey, listen, you know, on that last note at the end, can you hold it out a little longer? I got to go back and, and do that. So you, you, it, it helps to log your patch numbers. And I mean, these are not 60, 70, 80 track songs. So right. it's not complicated in that sense. Yeah. Well, I guess once you do anything on repeat, it becomes a little easier to come up with a system that you can yeah. uh, do again and, and find your way back, you know, the breadcrumb trail. Um, I've tried, uh, you know, I'll take photos with my phone of things, you know, and just mm -hmm. like now I've found that with AirDrop, that's a quick way to just put it right on the computer and I can drag it into the session folder and that, that can help. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. but, uh, you know, I have the Behringer DeepMind 12 too. And, and that cool one keyboard. is an all-in-one keyboard that's, I guess it's um, digitally controlled analog, I think is what it is. But it's got all the knobs on it for filters and everything. And it just makes the world of difference to me. Like finding a hunting, you know, hunting and pecking for a preset that's just right is like, it's fun to like find something that's like, Meh, a good starting place or something. But like, as soon as you grab knobs and start adjusting and filtering things and making changes, it just always becomes so much more interesting to me, you know? Yeah. And one of the things that's cool about having all the keyboards set up as, as a command station, so to speak, is that you can just start playing things on multiple synths and you just can quickly get into an, I mean, I like getting into an idea. I guess I'm kind of like, I think it was Eric Bazilian, uh, would say, he said it a lot throughout that podcast, man, I just want to get it to where I, I want the record. I want to get the record to sound like a finished record as quickly as possible. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm of that mindset too. Yeah. So get, get the parts, get them down, print them, commit to them and move on. That I enjoy doing that too. I mean, there are certainly times where I want to be able to go back and, and fix something, especially at the mix, at the mix stage. Absolutely. I, you know, there's a tendency where, um, and it may be related to the fact that I'm often finding myself in the exploration phase still of trying to find a sound, but 
you know, I'll I'll usually overdo something. I'll go a little too far and then be really glad I can come back and and yeah. adjust it again, you know. And one thing I will say is I do save my MIDI. So after I print a part, I might put all the MIDI in a folder. It's labeled what it is because, you know, it 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 is sort of irresponsible to put a bunch of parts down. Maybe there's some things that were a little more intricate and then you got have to relearn what you played a week later. Right. Because you didn't save your MIDI. Well, and especially since you're turning stuff in to somebody else who's going right. to approve it or not. And, yeah. you know, maybe ask for a change. So um, some of the people you've been working with uh, and the places that you've worked, which are pretty remarkable, uh, are places like Poland. I think you were yes. traveling to Poland a bunch for work, um, you know, before 2020. Uh, anything, any stories you want to share about that experience? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So I, I spent some time in Poland. I also spent some time in Romania. Um, from 2017 to 2019, I did four trips and connected with some people over there in both countries. Wonderful, wonderful musicians over there. Wonderful people. Phenomenal hospitality. I, I love Eastern Europe. And uh, I'm, doing, I'm continuing to work with my friend in Poland. Um, he's a songwriter and has been a songwriter for many years and had a, a popular project a few years ago in the, in the 90s. And so he's got different ideas for projects with artists where he comes in as the main songwriter. He has the label hookup. Uh, they still are doing some label stuff over there. It's interesting in, in that part of the world. I keep t I'll tell them about some of the trends that are going on here and they haven't quite reached Eastern Europe yet. So I, I, I feel like maybe two years after this, the trends here, I, I feel like there's about a two year gap. Um, so He's still doing some stuff with labels and finding artists and, and projects. And so what I'll do is I'll, I won't write with him because obviously he's writing in Polish. Um, there's an aesthetic and a, and a type of, a, a there's a style, but I will help with the production and mixing. And you know, what, what jump started that whole, uh, those trips was that I had it in my brain. What if you took this polished kind of expensive American uh, these American production sensibilities and you took it over to a part of the world that doesn't necessarily have access to it, or they don't have a lot of people there doing it. So because I've, I've done a lot of mainstream dance work and just a lot of pop music, that music has to have a certain level of shine on it. And I found that the guys that I met over there really liked that. They thought it was cool to have this sort of American sound, this, this more, shined up polished thing that they weren't necessarily able to get and that's what sort of endeared me to these circles that I that I uh wound up working in how did you find people to work with in another country what were some of the ways that you went from that might be a fun idea to actually you know stepping off an airplane in in another country and yeah. hitting the studio and what like Very what what encouragement or advice would you give to the rock stars if they want to really break out of their zone I'll uh, I'll zero in on Romania for that one because the the Poland contact came through a f uh, a friend of a friend of mine, so she she knew she knew my friend Tomek, and we got connected um, on Facebook and then I had decided to take a trip to Romania and decide but before I hit Romania I stayed in Poland for a few days and met him but anyway, to Romania I started to just dig around. This is in twenty seven. No, this is I think in twenty sixteen. I started digging around and listening to pop music in other countries just to hear what was going on, even though it was in different languages. And I stumbled upon Romania and started listening. And I thought, you know, this is cool. Like some guys are doing some cool stuff. Um, the, the production could be kicked up a little bit sonically, but I liked what I was hearing melodically and just, just it was interesting to me. And then I started digging around and I found out who the big players were doing pop music in Romania. And then I started looking at their Instagrams and just who was doing what. And then I found this production company. There's a, there's a production company in, in Bucharest called Ha 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 Productions. And it's owned by this one of the big, biggest male pop stars in Romania is a guy named Smiley. His real name is Andre. And, uh, he had a stable of guys working under him and 
I found this guitar player, Marius, who plays guitar with him. I messaged him on Instagram. We went back and forth. And then we wound up doing a Skype session, just talking like you and I are talking. And then I said, hey, man, I want to come over and visit. I've never been to that part of the world. And he said, let's do it. You know, I'll find you a place to stay. And we set it up. And um, he plays guitar with Smiley, still does. And I go to Romania. And this is summer of 2017. And they're doing this, Smiley's doing this big gig at this outdoor amphitheater, probably 4,000 people. And it was awesome, man. Like, it was just such a cool experience. And all these guys are much younger than me. You know, so at that time, I was 40, almost 46. And they're all in their late 20s, early 30s. There's a different hang over there in, in Eastern Europe. They, they like to go do the social thing first and then get down to business, whereas we're the opposite. Interesting. So, so business is happening in the evening. You guys are hitting the yeah, studio in the evening or now? Yeah, business. It's a very laid back culture there. Um, there there's a different work life balance. Uh, everyone is. I just had a lot of fun. I mean, it, it, you know, I I can't. It was hard for me to keep up with their drinking. Right. But uh, <laughs> is, was it vodka? It's sort of like the stories uh, I hear was, of people visiting it was, Russia. It, there was some of that. There was a lot of beer. There was a lot of you know going out until three in the morning on a Wednesday. Um, you know, stuff you would do in your stuff that we probably did in our twenties and. I still got my workouts in. I was really? hung over, but I did it. Yeah, it was, you just it got was, up in the morning and did it. I got I got up at like eleven. <laughs> to do it. Yeah. But uh, it was a great time, man. And I found that we clicked musically. I mean, you know, these, these are there's some really accomplished players over there. I mean, they follow what we're doing here. Uh, Marius is a phenomenal guitarist. I think he's probably one of the best guitarists in Romania. Great at jazz. Great at rock. He's he's a dear friend now. I've been over there four times. Uh, we we video chat on WhatsApp regularly. Uh, I mean, the, like this this group of people over there brought me in like family. It's That's cool. great. That's very cool, man. Yeah. Every studio needs a good vintage mic for that classic warm sound. Whether you're looking for those airy highs, sweet mid-range, or silky low end, a good vintage mic can put the magic in your mixes. So it's no wonder vintage mics have been loved and praised by thousands of engineers for decades. The Jay-Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia using only the best electronic components and feature the patented Golden Drop Capsule design for great detail and richness of tone that will bring that classic vintage vibe to your studio and be a real workhorse for your sessions. This time, our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have come up with a special offer only available to you, rock stars. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTAR to get 40% off the Vintage Series mics V67, V47, and V12, the mic you're hearing right now, at jayzmic.com. Do you want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with examples from a Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Do you want to know how to master your own music at home? Rockstars of Mastering will show you how with plugins in your DAW so that your music will sound awesome when you finish your mixes. And if you're looking for a step-by-step -step solution for a pro-sounding mix that won't take years to learn, the Ultimate Mixing Master Masterclass with Craig Alvin will show you a proven method for creating Grammy-winning quality mixes that you can apply in your home studio right now. Or if you just need to learn the fundamentals of creating a great sounding mix, then register for my free course, Mix Master Bundle, to get great mixes using simple, free plugins. And get started now making your best record ever at recordingstudiorockstars.com slash academy. Use the code ROCKSTAR at checkout to get 10% off any course for a limited time. Well, I'm looking at the map here too. Romania, of course, borders Ukraine and then also Bulgaria. And I remember when I started um, the podcast, I don't know if she would be listening to it still, but there was, we did the, the uh, Facebook group and there was a young engineer, a woman from uh, Bulgaria, I think it was, who was in our Facebook group for a minute, and she shared a video of a recording she had done, and it was a traditional band 
but it had these enormous like bass bagpipe instruments on either side of the stage and it was traditional folk music but i swear it sounded like the most incredible acoustic dubstep or something like that that i'd ever heard <laughs> and uh i don't know where she went maybe she's maybe she's still listening if you are give us a shout but um there's, there's yeah, definitely the some amazing incredible music over there and then we've had a guest on the show too who talked about uh you know, recording impulse responses of eight mile tunnels through the mountains and all kinds of stuff. Um, and it just, I'd love to go visit that part of the world and, and see what's going on at some point, you know? Yeah, it's cool. My grandfather, uh, my mom's mom was, well, it's the area is, is it's Ukraine now, but it was Russia back then. Right, um, right. Just across the river from Moldova into Ukraine. That was part of what drew me over there. I wanted to go. I, I haven't made it to Russia yet, but, um, yeah, I I loved it, and Poland is 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 just as amazing as well. I mean, like the the people over there, it's, it's interesting because they they find happiness with so much less than what we have. You know, smaller apartments, less stuff. You know, you're you're in a you can travel. People go do stuff. They go to other countries. They speak multiple languages. It's just a different hang. I liked it. Yeah, it I sounds great. It, actually, um, all right. It. Well, there was uh, one of the artists that's in your playlist rock stars i encourage you to scroll down and go listen to josh's music it's in the show notes just you can click on the link and go listen um casca was one of them um sounds really great uh deep bass very well mixed it's a it's Thanks. like well uh it's it sounds very big it sounds like there's a lot going on down there but it all adds up so what what thoughts do you have about balancing bass and kick in a kind of a house club sound like that. I don't know how you, how else you, how you might yeah. describe it. it. No, it's, it's a good question. Um, so that p project real quickly, Koska is a collaboration, uh, myself and my good friend, Chris Panagi, Chris, the Greek Panagi, who's, who's been a, uh, is also a veteran of the dance world. Great DJ, great friend. And we've been doing that project for a long time. We're actually shifting a little bit to where the project's going to start taking more of a pop sound now. Uh, a little bit slower on the BPMs, a little more pop radio uh, vibe than than what we've been doing. But to your question, um, I, I know this is going to probably annoy some engineers. I always make sure my kick drums are right at zero. I mix what kind of zero? Uh, just uh, like zero, zero full DB. scale, full zero scale. DB, VU dB or full scale on a meter, a digital meter. No, zero, zero, like zero dB, like zero dB in, in studio one where it, it yeah, right, right. Like unity, I guess if the fader right. is at zero. Yeah. I want, right. I want it at zero. I mix with the master bus settings on, um, I, from the start. Um, so the kick is super important and I just EQ or I'll side chain compression on the bass as needed so that the bass doesn't swallow up the kick. But I, I generally, I don't ever want to lose the kick in that music. If you lose the kick, if it starts fighting with the bass, uh, it just becomes a mess. You've lost your purpose. Yeah. In that music you have, yeah. Well, so that leads me into the, the other part of that question, which is, um, you know, this creating this kind of dance music pumping sound that is appropriate. I think sometimes we look at that and we think, oh, that's the sound of the, they're all going through a compressor and it's making the compressor bounce. And that's where we're hearing that from. But I'm wondering, you know, is that is that true? Or is it what you're saying, which is like, no, the kick is is your benchmark and you do not mess with the kick and everything else gets the gets that effect added to it in some way yeah. that sounds like they're pumping in a compressor, but they're not really. Yeah. So there's a couple ways to do the 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 pumping compression. It's the easiest way to do it now is just to get the LFO tool. Uh, it's a plug-in. I think it's, I don't know. Is that the Exford bucks. Records one? Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. I just, just got it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's great. And just, that's the best way to do it. And you can throw it on the instrument buses, just the keyboards or, but uh, obviously it would sound weird to do it on the drums, but, or you can have the kick side chain, the compressor, the compressor and put the compressor on various uh, instrument bus, instrument group buses as well. Um, but see now that pumping sound, it's not as, I, I don't want to say it's gone out of fashion because there's still a little of it that I hear in, in electronic music, but it's not, 
it's not front and center like it was 10 years ago in sort of ebbs and flows in different iterations, its role. But it's it's always there in some respect, I think. You know, the first record I ever noticed where I was like, whoa, that's cool, um, where I heard something like that. Um, and it was not what you first think of when you think of dance music. So it was actually quite slow in the pumping and breathing is Portishead. The oh, way yeah. they did that, boom, yeah. boom, you know, yeah. it's like the kick would, you'd hear the ride cymbal and just disappear and then slowly swell up for the next beat. Oh, it's a great effect. It's yeah, but it's, it's super fun. And um, rock stars, if you're not familiar with, you know, LFO tool or, or um, what is it? Shaper uh, yeah. by Cable Guys, I think is another one maybe. Uh, but essentially they're tools that let you draw out the actual volume of uh, what you want to ride in that time. And they're, they're, they need a grid, so you have to be on the grid. Right. So it wouldn't work if you were... Uh, unless there's some other way of using it, I would assume it wouldn't work if you're not on a click track and on a grid. Um, yeah, it can get a little messy. Yeah, but so it starts at the beginning of a bar or a beat, and you you know tell how long to be, and then it will you know you can draw in okay, make the sound down low here and bring it up by the end of the sound, and it's fun because you can get really playful with things. Oh, I, yeah. When I've messed with it though, I always I get really excited. I'm think I'm having a fun. Then I go listen to the mix later. I'm like, good lord, that sounds like a big pile of shit. So <laughs> I think it's just like you know getting a new I don't know guitar effect and you just use it on everything yeah. and then you're like, all right, I need to be a little more selective about where this it it can it can the yeah it can turn into that certainly. But I might yeah, have also been, you know, putting compression and stuff like that on the the stereo bus. Talk to us a little bit about your approach to a stereo bus with this mix. You said you're mixing into the master bus. Yeah, it's, um, you know, a long time ago, long time ago, let's just say over 10 years ago, um, it just became apparent that it made no sense for people to hear anything anymore that didn't sound pretty much done. Uh, it just It just opened up too many silly conversations for me to say, well, when it's mastered. So what I do now and I have for a long time is what you're hearing or what I'll say to people is listen to this as if I was going to upload it to Spotify tomorrow. And if you have any comments, let's deal with it. But there isn't going to be some whole other thing that goes on with the treatment of this song that went that then all of a sudden you go, oh, wow, it sounds so different from the mix that you gave me that I approved. Uh, I just think, you know, and again, with, with, with band stuff and, and live instrumentation, I think it's a little different, but when you're programming pop and dance and hip hop and all that, uh, what you should hand people to listen to is, I think is something that sounds pretty much done, maybe minus a few vocal rides or something like that. Um, so my master bus is a combination of ozone nine with an EQ a multiband compressor, um, a, the dynamic, uh, I, I'm not going to name it right, but there's a dynamics, like a, like a maximizer. That's what it is, a maximizer. And then um, I think that's it. And then there's another, then there's um, a limiter, the precision limiter from UA. And then there's another limiter. Uh, and, and the limiting is very slight. This is not, I'm not hitting anything hard, but when you, when you stack limiters serially, it just brings it a little bit more forward. And then I control it. You know, if this isn't, if something's not going to be put up for streaming, I'll go louder than if it is, if it is going to be used for streaming, I found that, oh, and then I have, uh, sorry, the waves loudness meter at the end. So I can check out my LUFS and all that. And yeah. I generally, I generally don't like to go above minus 10. Um, if it's going to go up on a streaming platform, which I know some people will say you should go even softer than that. I get it, but it's very difficult to turn in things to clients that are too soft. It's right. just a night. It's a nightmare. Yeah. So, Cause they're not listening to it off Spotify. No. They're just pressing right. play somewhere. Right. So you, you've got to, you've got to factor that in. Um, if it so that's about where i hang out is about around minus 10 but once i started sending out mixes to people all those years ago with and it's really been that that setting for a long time 
you j- I just got way, way less mix revisions. I mean, and the kinds of things that I got back were, oh, it sounds great. Could you maybe bump the chorus vocal up a dB? Right. Because you can't expect people to listen to something that's almost finished. And then they comment on that almost finished work. And then someone else does something to the track to finish it, quote unquote. And then they go listen to it again and they go, well, wait a minute. This changed now. Like there's there's more limiting on it. Now my voice sounds more forward or, it, you know, you know what I mean? Like it's, it, it's just, I don't know. I, I just, that doesn't work for me. Yeah. Uh, so it, so a logical question would be if someone's going to master one of your mixes, what do you do? I take the limiters off and I just back down the headroom and then I send it off with, with enough room for them to work. Okay, cool. Uh, cool. Yeah. Um, I dig that. And that was great. Nice breakdown of the stuff that's going on there. Sure. And it's one of the beauties of ozone. I remember when I first learned about ozone, it's me, you know, hunting around on the internet, like, how does Skrillex get that sound? And people are like, right. he masters in ozone or something, you know, and that was the first well, time it's I Well, I mean, it. you know, in, in, in the mainstream music, man, the, the master bus setting is huge. I mean, if you take the master bus off on a lot of these tracks, it sounds completely different. Right. So right. It, it's a big part of the sound. Do you feel like the time you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks and tweaking version after version of your mixes has not gotten you anywhere? Have you been looking for a simple or straightforward step-by-step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could learn that process from a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is for you. Now you can discover a proven step-by-step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Here's a quote from one of the students. Absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information mentoring on the mix process I've ever been a part of. This was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, condensed into a six to seven hour session. Look, when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and go check out Craig's ultimate snare mixing trick now for free. You know, it's funny. I was listening to some of this stuff last night, actually, on my TV. I just, I had installed Spotify there and I got a stereo hooked up to that and I was checking it out. And and at first I was like, I was like, huh, the vocals were, were a little low on this thing. I was like, I wonder if that's like, a, you know, just where the sound is at. And then I was like, mm, wait a minute, hold on, let me just check, check my TV settings. And it had the surround setting on. Oh, <laughs> I interesting. Like, oh, let me turn oh. that off. Wow. <laughs> Completely. Wow. So, but just, you know, to your point of, something can really change the sound of something else, yeah. you know, what it, you're it's, listening um, to. I mean, that completely like took the center image and just made it disappear, you know? It's, it's, it's a double-edged sword, man. Like everyone sort of messes with everyone else's product now. You know, it's, you, you put it in iTunes, there's levelers, there's EQ settings, the car stereo does its thing. So it, you can't cover all your, all scenarios. It's yeah. impossible. Yeah. It's, you know. Well, and when you're talking about doing club, stuff you said if it goes up on streaming i guess the other option is maybe some people people are taking this and they're directly playing it in clubs and right. that's a whole different beast that you probably have to address as well but um yeah. before rather than open up that topic entirely i think it's just good to be aware that it exists um let me ask you one more question before we kind of close out here sure uh the 808 so some of your production has that kind of 808 base to it it's not yeah. really a kick drum but it is a big low end that needs to be treated with with respect in a mix. So what are some tips you want to share with the rock stars about how to address kind of a big 808 sound in a in Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I, I find, you know, it, it sounds like it should be so easy, but it, it's actually it's actually tricky. The, the low end is one of the hardest parts. You know, I, I'm on small speakers. I don't have a sub, so... When I need to check the low end, I'll go into various headphones or even go out to the car. And uh, now I have my room really dialed in, so I, I know. But as far as the 808 goes, I almost always, for that music, I'll side chain it to the compressor, but I'll make sure that the attack is short and the release is long so that it doesn't sound like it's pumping too much. Because 
sometimes if the, if the compressor isn't set right, it'll sound like a pumping effect that's out of time as opposed to a gradual release of the compression. So I almost always side chain off the kick. Yeah, that, that's, that's what it, and I just use the Studio One factory. So uh, a compressor. typical production might be an 808, which is like, doom, really long. Right. But there's also something that's got, got boom, like a short yeah. kick that goes with that a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. And I will EQ. Um, I will give, I know the 808 is, tip, is typically a sub and some of those frequencies can live, are, are pretty low, but I will roll off enough so that I'm not losing the kick, you know, and maybe right. I'll boost in the low 100s or something if I feel like I need a little more roundness at the bottom. So the kick the is short, but it still reaches down to the lowest of the lows. In Absolutely. That where it yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, weird, you know, sometimes I you know when I think about it too hard I just get lost, you know. I'm like which way should things be and it's the more I pay attention to stuff the more I notice that the kick drum often has the quality of reaching the lowest cuz it's just happening for a moment. Right. You know, and then the the bass with sustain often tends to be up higher than that, you know, in a in a range and it probably makes sense. It probably would be a little bit insane if you know, 20 Hertz was just steadily cranking for an entire yeah. bar, you know, I don't know. Well, it can, it, and what can happen also when you hear those tracks in a club, you'll hear the kick and then there'll be almost a, a, a slight delay. It'll, it'll be like kick, mm, kick mm, like that. Right. And so you have to just watch I'll I'll change the release of the 808 so that it's not super long. And so what um, you just described would be a good result or that would be an awkward result in the club. That would be awkward because it would because you would hear a kick and then there'd be just an ever slight delay and then you'd hear this low tone. So it'd be almost some like another instrument coming in in the wrong place right. or something. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh but but so I think in addition to compressing the the 808 or the the low bass whatever you have, also be aware of the release time of the bass itself because if the bass notes are sustaining too much then it just starts to muddy everything up and then if you're mixing on small speakers are you even hearing those low things on the small speakers or is this where the techniques about saturation and things and distortion come into play where you're that brings out the upper harmonics of the 808 um interestingly enough the way that these focals sound inside the attack wall is giving me uh, a deeper low end response than if I was listening to them on my dining room table. So I'm able to get into some lower frequencies because of, of the way my room is set up sonically. And I also uh, have a couple of spots in my room where if I stand off to the side, I can hear l the low end uh, differently than if I'm right at, you know, in, in the, the sweet spot. Like exaggerated. The, I find yeah. the exaggerated spots are probably helpful because they give us they are they give us an insight into well what's going to happen when this plays out in the uncontrolled world in yeah, a certain situation yeah. yeah but but it's interesting when you hear your music in a club uh it's very revealing you know you it, it's it's a totally different environment um so yeah it, it does take a minute to to get a handle on it right on well we're getting to the end here so let me kind of jump forward um one one quick question. Any new plugins that you're just super excited about? Anything you want to give a shout out to or tell the rock stars about? Yes. Um, I this isn't super new, but I've been using it for mastering. Not not it's not it doesn't live on my mix bus. Like I'll use this if I'm mastering a project that I'm also mixing. So what I would do is let's say I've got an EP and I'll just pull the limiters off. And then set up a mastering session in Studio One and, and actually do the proper mastering. Gol, uh, this it's a it's a plugin by Golfa, Golfoss. Um, yeah, you know what I'm talking yep. about. Yep. Yeah, I'm probably late to the game on this one because it's been out for a while, but I love it, man. It's really cool. So Golfoss Rockstars does this tricky thing where it basically breaks up the music into like 300 narrow bands and it rides each one of them and it sort of analyzes. Okay, what's are we a little shy on the bass or we, do we need a little more, you know, smiley face EQ on this track? And, um, and you can also take things that there's too much of and you can dial it back. Um, I forgot what the terminology is in there, but uh, it's sort of like tone it down or enhance it a little bit. What, what are the, yeah. 
uh, I, put you I, on the spot, but I can't. I can't remember I get exactly. It. I get it. Go, but what, what? What? What about the? You know, when I've used it, I found myself um, pushing it a little too far, and then coming back and going, "I'm going to dial it back a little bit." You know, it's like one yeah, of those. Me too. Me too. Yeah. It's it's not a little goes a long way. Uh, and another another just I mean this isn't a, new, a necessarily a new plugin, but this is something for people to think about if if they're struggling with um, getting the EQ right. Is Ozone has the EQ match, um, right. which is which which I have certainly used. I mean, why not? If somebody wants something to sort of hit a specific style or or sonic palette, yeah. Throw it in there and, and do it. Uh, it's great. And Ozone um, also now has, you know, like Master Assistant where it will basically yeah. help guide you towards the results you want or it'll give you a starting template. And as far as Golf House goes, it's Recover. That's right, Recover. And tame. Recover. So th those tame, sort of make yeah. sense. Recover is like, you don't have enough of this, so we're going to bring it back for you. Tame is you got too much of this, you can back it off. And you just increase the percentage of either one. Yeah, and then, and, I mean, I think bias, I might be which like, gives you, which is like, which one do you want to lead towards more? And then Brighton, which is what you think it is. Yeah, I think I'm at like 10% with Golf Foss. I mean, it's not a lot, but it, but I do like what it does and I can hear, certainly hear what it does. It, yeah. it just does the right stuff. Yeah, cool. Awesome, dude. Well, um, those are great, great tips. So thank you for sharing those. Here, we're sure. going to close out with our hypothetical question. We're going to take the Wayback Studio Machine once again. I would go back and find young Josh. Um, I don't know what you're doing. Oh, you young Josh who doesn't know so much about compression at this point yet uh, and, or something like that. And you say, listen, I come back to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice do you want to go back and give yourself if you could? Uh, I would say it's okay to make a mess of something while you're learning so that you better understand what the tool does and how to use it. Nice, dude. And I know you you're you're a, you're a pretty neat guy, so yeah, thank giving you. yourself well, to, uh, you know, advice to permission to go make a mess is a big deal. Yeah, and uh, you know, certainly you don't want to do it at the expense of the artist's project, but I mean is it's okay if if you don't understand a concept, you have to play with it, mess it up a little bit and then start to, you know, dial it in. Yeah. And get better at it. And then get it right. Get it right. Awesome, so. dude. Great to hang with you, man. I look forward to seeing Thanks, you, you on too, my, man. my next visit to St. Louis. Yes. Can't wait. Um, let the rock stars know where should they go check out your work? Where would you like them to come find out more about you? And what if they're ready to make their next uh, hit okay, dance so track with you or, or any other kind of track? Hopefully by the time this comes out, I will have cleaned up my website and, and updated it. So it's joshharrismusic.com. The link to the email... I killed the info at joshharrismusic.com email. So if anyone wants to email me, just do josh at joshharrismusic.com. Uh, hopefully by the time this comes out, we'll have a, a, a revamped site. All right, good, good tip. Maybe that's what you take the way back studio machine yes, and tell yourself. Yes. Yeah. Don't Get use your website info. <laughs> Don't use info. It, it, bad, 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 bad. Awesome, dude. Well, great to hang with you, Rockstars. Thanks, Thanks for man. listening, Josh. I'll see you around the studio, dude. All right, buddy. Thanks. All right, man. Cheers. See ya. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make great music.
Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our awesome sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Spectra 1964, Jay-Z Microphones, Adam Audio, Solid State Logic, and Isotope. Remember to use these coupon codes for special discounts. At isotope.com slash rockstars, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plug-in purchase or start your extended 30-day free trial subscription for access to many plugins. At jzmic.com, use the code ROCKSTAR for 40% off the V47, V67, and V12 microphones. That's what you're hearing my voice on right now. At recordingstudiorockstars.com slash academy, use the coupon ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course for a limited time. If you enjoyed Recording Studio Rockstars, then please check out our sponsors using the link in our show notes because it's a great way to help support this show. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio, and they're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Stremming, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks so much for listening, Rockstars, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.